against the uh, the rogue because one of the things I find that's most useful for rogue, uh, the weapon rogue, sorry, is that use of the uh, the cloak to be able to uh, get out of the way of any OTK potential from their opponent. The but Demon Hunter, of course, has a pretty nifty way of sidestepping that. Years. Yeah, they don't actually need to target the enemy hero in order to deal damage, that damage to them. They just target their own minions. And because of that, in a vacuum, I would say Demon Hunter probably has more game on top of also having the glides to mess with the rogue. But um, then we have to take into account that Weapon Rogue is now also running just a lot of damage from hand. That's not all face up on the weapon, right? It's the fact that they have Mr. Smite, etc. Um, not this particular version from Jake Vice, though, which has none of the pirate package and instead is running Garrot with the Guild Trader as the type of end game combo. And that's going to be something that Glide can disrupt even more heavily because Weapon Rogue is hoping to get to the bottom of their deck in order to secure that Garot damage. And on top of all of that, there's also the fact that Tian Ming is still running Rustrot Viper in his OTK Demon Hunter. He's not slotted in the need for greed. So with all these factors, I feel like Tian Ming's a heavy favorite. It's, yeah, especially with this starting hand. Like you say, the Glide could be a, a huge disruption factor. Um, I think it should be relatively easy turns for Tian Ming at the start, just going for the sigil, get first level of quest completed. Uh, but for Jake Weiss, with this hand, are you ever considering playing the Blackwater Cutlass because you don't have any of the better weapons to go for? Yeah, I think so, just to make the cutting class cost three for the very next turn and get some measure of card draw rolling. It's obviously not ideal, not getting any discounts on the Garots, but it's a miserable hand, right? He needs um, Swine Tusk Shark to even think about getting a game plan together. He can't even afford to worry about Vipers and Glides because he hasn't even found the win condition in the first place. We see obviously at the start here as well with Jake Vice repping the uh, the Brazilian jersey, showing some pride for his uh, home nation as well. It has the uh, all the makings of a fantastic weekend for the Brazilian Hearthstone community with Pascoa already guaranteeing his spot essentially in Grandmasters. Leandro Leal possibly making it through. Jake Vice as well possibly making it through. Uh, it's going to be. Uh, I'm sure a, a night of great celebration for the entire Brazilian Hearthstone scene, especially if this win comes through for Jake Weiss and he gets himself that spot in Grandmasters next season. But to start things off, he knows it, we know it. This is not the kind of start you want to see. This glide just backbreaking. Well, it does delete a lot of Jake Weiss's hand, but honestly, the hand wasn't that good to begin with. It was double garage. That's true. It could improve, Derek. He could get a shank back from this. Who knows? Um, I'll tell you what, Chen Ming's hand, though, did come back with an Ilganoth in the far left, which is not amazing. So honestly, I'm not sure who got the better end of this glide. <laughs> well, Jake Weiss now being told, so you like weapons, eh? We'll have all the weapons in the world. Shank self-sharpening swords and none of it really what he wanted to see. He needs now uh, the Silverleaf Poison, right? The Cussing Class, some way to actually turn this hand into extra value because it's not getting there at the moment. I do love the choice to go for Triple S over Swine Tusk Shank, double S if you will, uh, because one, he's got two self-sharpening swords and these are perhaps the less important of the weapons when it comes to getting together that late game, long lasting damage potential. So it is starting to put some pressure on Tian Ming, but also is less weak, uh, um, not as vulnerable to the Viper. Uh, Tian Ming here, very expensive card draw option in the skull and I-Beam and Chaos Leech, no good targets at the moment. I feel like it might just be Skull and impatient. play it for five mana the next turn. Oh my god, I hate everything. <laughs> it feels awful, doesn't it? Because that doesn't even complete quest. You're only drawing three cards and you're guaranteed to have no mana left over as well. Um, because I'm not offering any better solutions, I still think I agree with you. Uh, but it feels absolutely horrific. He's pretty much all in on finding another Spectral or a Glide off the top uh, to do anything with this hand. Yeah, um, picking the Skull does not mean he's committed to playing it for five mana the next turn. He could still go digging with Acrobatics for a way to progress quest, or just eventually find his other Glide and use that to put the Skull back in the deck for a post-Kerchus situation. But things are not looking up for Jake Weiss either. Both players operating with very much below average hands. Okay, double jump 
obviously can get glide in the best case scenario, but again for Tian Ming, if he goes for that and hits I-beam, say, is the, the less good option, and then has to go for acrobatics and misses a tradable, I it's just more card draw that he's using that doesn't progress the quest, which is the worst situation that you can be in as the OTK Demon Hunter. He does hit Spectral Sight, which is uh, alongside Glide, the good outcome. And so now, if nothing else, he just has acrobatics uh, to rip and get the quest completed. Between acro and the guild trader, the guild trader does, you know, save the acro for next stage of quest on the following turn, but it's not mana efficient. And also, because he's on stage two, the acro gives him that benefit of discounting an extra card with the over completion. So I do like the choice of acrobatics here. Gonna commit the sigil as well which means that he'll only need three other card draw um, on the next turn to get Kurtris in hand. Hey, Jake Weiss is actually spending a mana on this turn. What a turn up. A <laughs> uh, real uh, glow up here is he, uh, again, as I was saying, he's just not having the hand he wants. He can just throw out uh, the Sinister Strike and the Wicked Stab if he wants to, to spend the mana, but that's not really the way you want to play as OTK or versus OTK Demon Hunter. You want to be you want to be constantly threatening lethal so that if they go for the big heal because they feel scared, they end up overhealing. But you don't want to preemptively use all of that burn because then they just heal back up to 30 anyway. It's true. And it's not to say that OTK Demon Hunter has unlimited big heals. I'd say the Reno effect happens twice at best, and we've already accounted for yeah. one studies, which is not an additional I-beam or Chaos Leech. And after mm. that, they're out of combo pieces to actually end the game. It can get in a weird fatigue situation versus older versions of Weapon Rogue, but now we're talking about the Garot version with Guild Trader, which can still get there, even with the nerf to Garot if you just save a bit of other weapon damage or Wicked Stab damage from the Weapons ro Rogue side. Uh, Tian Ming mm. here, with the option to get Kurtris in hand with the glide, but I think it's once again giving him a bit of a read that Jake Weiss has had like nothing good to do these past few turns. The glide yeah. might be benefiting uh, Jake Weiss even more. Right, like I think if I was going to glide here, I would trade first and then go with the glide just because you have such a strong read on them having a garbage hand. Looks like he wow. is not even going to glide at all. It is a full pass here from Tianming. Essentially, he does have the capability of getting Kurtris in hand by using Skull next turn and then the weapon swing, but I'm concerned about his hand space, right? That's very expensive. Well, the alternate route that I'm seeing for Tianming is when turn nine rolls around, he has lethal. It's just in the hand. He doesn't even need to play Kurtris at any point in this game. And I... I don't know if that's his game plan currently, but it's at least a North Star to guide your game plan through here. That if you can just survive until turn nine, you will win the game at that point. Uh, the problem is, of course, if Jake Weiss is just passing every single turn, his hand kind of has to be burned realistically in one way or another. Uh, so you do need to be afraid of just, of just dying to all of that. And we are already at a break point where if Tianming doesn't go for any heal here, Jake Weiss has the possibility of the hand being double Wicked Stab Sinister Strike, yeah. which is 11 damage. And he's already got two damage on a weapon here. So Tianming, I think I could see the reasoning for holding on to Kurtis, but I wonder if he can afford to be that patient. It works out if he can find his second Feldscream Blast, like an okay. So now he can use some of these combo pieces for just healing, but again, because he has to use the discounted pieces, he's not going to have the turn 9 lethal anymore. Right, and well, the turn 9 lethal involves all of his combo pieces. He can't throw down any of these minions and hope to still be able to get there. Um, he can use the more expensive Arcanist and then hope to draw Moag. Two mana Moag would still afford him that full combo, but this is fairly piecemeal healing. This isn't bursting him up all the way back up to 30. And so a little bit of poison damage for Jake Weiss as he throws his hands together in prayer and thanks uh, for this deadly poison. This is now the kind of damage that can actually get a little scary for Tian Ming. He tried to hold out for one more turn, and I do like the decision to go Arcanist I-Beam. That gives him breakpoints to survive, I think, all 
um, almost every combination of burst that Jake Vice could have had in hand. But the 15 breakpoint is once again in the danger zone. And now Tianming is down a uh, an I-beam and down an Arcanist as well. How much can he actually afford to throw away while still keeping Ooh. intact the combo? But the Viper is insane! Oh my goodness. Okay, so you trade again. You need one more trade effect. Oh, the perfect draw as well to be able yep. to trade, get Kurtris in hand. It destroys the weapon. He's almost never dead here. I'd struggle to think of a combination of cards that could do it. Yeah. Um, and then he just could start setting up the lethal in the next couple turns. Yep. Good order as well to go Viper before the Guild Trader so that the Kurtris is not overdrawn. I think it'll get him to 10 cards in hand, so the next card off the top will be overdrawn, but I think he's got enough. Another like, both Fell Screams are in hand safely. It's really close, isn't it? I guess next turn he can go Ilganoth, Moog, Felscreen Blast first, which does four. Four. And then he has 18 after that. So it's not necessarily lethal, even if the snake sticks. Uh, if the snake can go face as well, then it is. Um, but without that, it's just two damage short. Or four damage. For Jake Vice here, the best he can do is... Uh, not lethal here. One from the self-sharpening, five with Wicked Stab, eight with Sinister Strike, and uh, nine with the Paralytic. He can coerce the Viper, which I would recommend doing here just to be completely safe, but I guess he's saving it. it for Kurtris, so that is just the game. Yep. You go Ilganoth, Moog, Felscreen Blast. Felscreen. Four that damage. Six. Or, uh, well, with the Snake, uh, yes, oh, six, with right? Yes, true. And then you and then play the Arcanist, play the other Felscreen Blast, and that's lethal. Mm -hmm. I think it could have gotten there even without the Viper being on board. Like, it had to stick for 3 damage, but Hero Power would have done it as well, right? Like a 4 plus 18 plus Hero Power, but obviously this leaves no room for error for Tianbing. Nicely done here in a game that was very difficult to piece together on both sides because both yeah. players had the awareness that either player had bad hands, right? Or just they were not doing the ideal thing. But you also need to kind of have an idea of if they're not doing the best things with their hand, that kind of means they have the combo pieces or the burst. So what's the break point that you need to stay alive? And um, we were talking about Coerce on the Viper could have let Jake Vice survive for one more turn because we knew exactly what Tianming had. But from Jake Vice's perspective, it could have been a whole different set of cards that was discounted and he was instead trying to hold the cores for a bigger threat in the Kirchus the next turn. Yeah, that's right. It, it made sense what Jake Weiss was going for there. It obviously did not work out for him in this instance, uh, but I can understand. It's like very, very specific breakpoints that you would need to work through to come to the conclusion that it's worth it to kill off the snake on that turn. Uh, but the real important decision for me, the really interesting turn there, I think, came from Tian Ming, where he didn't go for that second glide, right? Where he could have set up for guaranteed Kurtris, thrown that down, and gone for the more traditional game plan. Whereas he took the risk of saying, that with the discounted cards he had in hand, he didn't need to go for the glide. It almost didn't work. If he hadn't found the snake, he might have just been dead before he even got to go for the OTK. But his unconventional plan, his win willingness to adapt, in this instance, was the winning play, I think. Indeed. And uh, honestly, ever since the nerf to Ilganoth going up to six mana, I've almost thrown that type of alternate win condition out the window. Um, even if you do get a lot of discounts on combo pieces, you in most matchups come to the conclusion that turn 9 is too late, waiting till turn 9 and letting my opponent do whatever they like till that point is generally too late, but Weapon Rogue is one of the few classes where sometimes you can have a very good read on them not developing anything. They don't run minions very much, yeah. so you're not going to have additional pressure. It's just face up how much damage the weapon is threatening and Tian Ming navigated that quite nicely indeed, but we are now coming to the rogue versus rogue matchup. One of them, Garot, and one of them, Weapon with Garot. And I tend to throw the favor to regular Garot Rogue here because just the small minions acting like a zoo type of game plan can be very powerful against Weapon Another Rogue. And Tian Ming has some of the makings of that kind of hand, right? The the big boy he's missing is obviously Octobot that really ties that whole game plan together. Uh, but just being able to go for 
couple of one drops. Maybe if he finds Guardian Org Merchant, that's very often enough to actually protect your field contact, uh, especially given that uh, Jake Weiss is not playing Prize Plunderer, so his reactivity is incredibly low in this list. Um, a lot of alternate lines for Tian Ming. I was right. looking at just Ethereal Og Merchant just to get something on board. Yeah, it dies to Dagger, but it's okay. You can follow up even with Broomstick One Thief. That's decent for turn three into the Shroud of Concealment. Uh, but it looks like Tian Ming is holding out on the Ethereal maybe to go alongside a Field Contact turn. Um, I do value it a lot lower than Guardian Og Merchant in the matchup though, because that Divine Shield is way more threatening in my opinion. Tian Ming just playing minions. I can respect this. Again, like I was saying, I don't think the coin is worth it here because he's found that Guardian Org Merchant. It's such a powerful combo uh, alongside the field contact, and I wouldn't be at all surprised to just see it next turn. Contact into Coin Og Merchant is really tough for Jake Weiss to deal with. And already as early as now, looks like he was debating just sending the dagger face into equip right. with self sharpening sword. But I don't really see the downside to clearing a broomstick here. Um, maybe he just doesn't think that the one damage over several turns is going to be threatening enough. Yeah, I mean, he's just all in on the race plan, right? He's saying, if I just ignore everything that's happening and launch all my damage to the face, that will get there. And it is a lot of damage. We're looking at a double oh, deadly yeah. poison on self-sharpening sword hand. And in a matchup where the opponent doesn't have any healing effects, self-sharpening is often better than Swine Tusk Shank. So for Tian Ming now, it's all about how quickly he can turn up the gas, going for the play that we were recommending of the Guardian Og Merchant. But again, I'm staring at this ethereal that could have come down many turns prior and dealt True. that two damage. No, that's a very, very good point. I think that playing that on turn one was... I mean, he was clearly indecisive on it. He did not know which way to go. Oh yeah. my goodness, this damage. Indeed, and I think he got the good discount as well with the Blackwater Cutlass because he still has the mana to go for all the poisons here and the Grog <laughs> can just be paired with the Guild Trader. However, yeah. Tian Ming has stuck a field contact to the board. That is usually one of the most dangerous things you can let your opponent do, but on four mana, he's going for the double contact! Lorinda, where you at? <laughs> You never go full contact. And here with Ethereal Org Merchant as well. I mean, I guess you can just play it, set up for that cram session again. It's still, I think, probably just too slow. You're going to have to do some serious Octobot shenanigans, but then board space becomes a real concern. Uh, but even so, the race is pretty even right now. Jake Weiss needs some of those extra cards, and cutting class is exactly the kind of stuff he needs to see. I felt like he was looking for Cloak more than anything, though, because there's a non-zero chance he dies this turn. I think he's just short of having his own lethal, but next turn he will certainly kill Tian Ming. So right now for Tian Ming, we're looking at 12 damage on board. So if Tian Ming had a Garot of his own and some card draw, that's the fear factor for Jake Weiss, right? Wow, you're actually right. I kind of assumed that Tian Ming would never be able to hit lethal here because it's turn five, but it very possibly could be. Oh, no garrots. Can the one thief be stepped for like a fireball or something? Because Tian Ming cannot be bothered about trying to survive this turn. He just has to go for counter lethal, I think. Oh, double shadow step as well. I was thinking maybe you go for the Org Merchant, uh, as in the Ethereal Org Merchant for bonus spell damage, but Tian Ming is just drawing like an absolute madman right now. Finds the garrot! One garrot, but is it going to be enough? He has the prep for the garrot. One spell damage already on board. He's going to get it up to two with the second play of the Ethereal Og Merchant. So this garrot is dealing four damage. And there is still nine damage left to attack on board. So we are looking at one bleed and a dagger for lethal. So you step this, play it again, two draws, hand space is not an issue. He just needs to hit the bleed. Uh, oh! There it is! He did it! The madman! 
Unbelievable. Right. What a game from Tian Ming. A turn five lethal on the Garot Rogue. The kind of thing you never expect to see, especially against the Weapon Rogue that hits the weapons, hits the poison, hits the draw, had lethal next turn. Tian Ming playing the game of his life. That was unbelievable. It was, and I can't stress enough how complicated those last few turns for Tian Ming right. was because obviously it made a lot of sense to set up all the minions. I didn't think all the minions meant double contact because Me that creates hand space issues, but it's just the most attack you can get while also giving you the fastest engine to find Garot. And even the decision to look for Garot as opposed to stepping the Wand Thief, I couldn't tell you the odds on what type of player you're supposed to go for. I didn't believe he could find a Garot soon enough, but he did, and he found the bleed right after that. There's just so many different ways to approach that. I would love to ask many Garot experts about the best way to go about it, and we can already just go all the way back to the decision of not playing Ethereal Aug Merchant on turn one, and that in some ways looked like it was bad because he missed damage at the beginning, but having that to then append two spell damage to his Garot turns was actually what gave him lethal later on. <laughs> really complex. Super, super difficult stuff, but the kind of thing that Tian Ming seems to be very much in control of. Like, again, it, it's the kind of play that just smells like he's done that kind of thing before, even though that's an incredibly niche situation to happen in Garot Rogue. The fact that he started immediately, it felt like he didn't have any qualms, any hesitations as to what the correct play would be, and getting it done is uh, truly impressive stuff. And he's going to need that same kind of mentality on this control warlock, the uh, quest delete warlock, as it is often called, that relies entirely on the fatigue game plan at the end when Blightborn Tamsin uh, comes down to be able to turn your self-damaging effects into damaging effects for your opponent. And for Mijia, the real standout of this deck is these highlighted cards. Grimoire of Sacrifice and Moag Artificer have proven to be such standout cards. They're amazing. The amount of removal potential has just made Soul Rend obsolete in the deck. Even in a deck that wants to get to the bottom immediately and start fatiguing, Soul Rend seems like an instant fit, but just the fact that Grimoire and Moarg have so much flexibility, like they're good separately and in certain situations are amazing together, I think has made for a very cool, somewhat new iteration of this quest lock archetype. I will say though, they're probably not that great versus Weapon Rogue. You're not looking to remove minions in particular, but the Moark still has utility alongside Drain Soul and to, to a certain extent Touch of the Nathrism just to get more healing because Tian Ming's all about the sustain in this matchup. Jake Weiss looking like a much more uh, deflated version of himself now having lost twice with the Rogue, queuing up, queuing up a third time again. Uh, you know, some players like just going for the same thing over and over again to try and get their head in the uh, the headspace for this deck. But for some players, it can tilt you pretty hard, losing with the same deck twice in a row, getting bad beats on it two games in a row, and then going for it again instantly can lead to some shaky plays. Uh, but for Jake Weiss, I hope that that will not be the case. Prep into Passage to try and find either the Self-Sharpening Sword or the Shank. He finds the sword, so the game can begin now. Indeed. I think for Jake Vice, this is a case of just trying to get the most problematic deck to have a win here, banging his head against the wall. Um, it hasn't worked so far, and it's still looking not great because looking at the list from Tian Ming, even the Warlock has a Viper in it. That tech card, enough to dash Jake Vice's dreams potentially, because without that, I feel like the Weapon Rogue has a very solid matchup, even with all the healing in the Warlock. The, the Weapon Rogue can get the weapon up to a certain point where it is threatening lethal with yeah. some of the burst cards held back in hand like Garot, like the Wicked Stab. Uh, but because there's a Viper for Tian Ming, he can shut down some of those clean two-turn setups. Passage numero dos coming in for more poisons, hopefully this time. Uh, we want to see Silverleaf, fantastic, deadly poison, paralytic poison. Oh, the rest of the hand, not really what you're looking for, but I guess just throwing down a Sinister Strike to thin your deck and deal some extra damage. It's, uh, it's looking brighter than it was in the other two games for Jake Weiss. Certainly. Just a little bit short of being able to play the Cutting class, which is, you know, not ideal, but he still has the second one in hand and the Swindle, so it's not a disaster. He will be able to get the card draw train rolling, which all just seems to snowball so much with this Weapon Rogue, right? You find the weapon, suddenly the rest of the deck gets so much stronger. But for Tian Ming, the Rune Mithril Rod equipped last turn, 
starting to bear fruit this turn. The hand is so cheap, getting the tour guide into Mana Feeder Panthera to keep the train rolling, spending all the mana. It just looks so powerful. Oh, it's just deals on deals on deals. The bargains he's getting on these uh, mana costs. Unbelievable. Like, Mana Feed is able to come down this turn, next turn. Raise Dead getting some premium cards as well. The Armor Vendor is fantastic. Tour Guide and Mana Feeder, mana feeder to just further speed up his draw. Uh, I still don't think it's looking great for him. Make no mistake. Jake Weiss right. has got off to a really powerful start, and this is not a good matchup for the Warlock. But if you're going to have a chance, it looks like this. Indeed. Um, it's still going to be problematic for Tianming to actually complete his quest. Drawing cards, no problem, but he doesn't have that much health to work with to tank another 16, building. right? I think he's still on layer one here. Um, so Jake Weiss really needs to capitalize by finding the other weapon sooner rather than later and um, eventually putting together that end game of the guild trader with the Garots. More Might not even draw. need the shank to be fair. He could just get there with second self sharpening sword, but yeah. um, the the fact that they have very finite durability means that your total damage from all the poisons is a little bit um, less than the swine tusk shank. I mean, as I see, I think he might not even need any other weapons at all. He's got a bunch of spell damage, sinisters, garrots, wicked stabs. He can quite happily just get there uh, by drawing his entire deck. Uh, in order to get down to that point. Uh, Tianming is getting to the point there where he has these super powerful heal options though. Moog plus Drain Soul is of course six healing a pop. Could go all the way back up to full essentially uh, if he wants to on this turn. Uh, but he again just needs to be considering how am I balancing the heal whilst also keeping my own game plan on the straight and narrow. Yeah, and that own game plan part of it is why you see him equipping the Rune Mithril Rod here just to um, start setting up to discount the Hand of Gul'dan once more and have that be in tandem with Tamsin is usually one of the most powerful things you can do for the late game combinations. Uh, finds the other Moarg, which is huge because he does get the big healing for this turn, right? But it's not going to be enough versus Weapon Rogue. Um, Jake Weiss does have a bit of a conundrum, though, as to whether he wants to allocate any resources to dealing with this Morg. Thankfully, he does have Coerce, which is not something that can be translated into face damage. So that's something he should be pretty happy to throw down to just delete any chances of further healing from the Morg. And so how's the rest of this turn rounding out then? Are we prioritizing using some of these burn spells now so that the mana is spent on them or just still doubling down on that card draw? Close because the card draw is somewhat dependent on a weapon being stuck as well because this is a silver leaf poison and last charge on the self sharpening. So for Jake Weiss, he could start with the swing and see what that last card gives him. If it's a swine tusk shank, I feel like that plus coerce would be a decent turn. It's obviously a bit slow on the damage train, but sets up his prospects for continuing to cycle through the deck pretty well. And if he misses on the swine tusk shank, I'd imagine re equip self sharpening could be pretty high up on the priority list. Obviously, the Pantheras are not a threat whatsoever. Jake Weiss's health is going to be very safe until Blightborn Tamsin comes into play. It's really just the Morg threatening additional healing. Okay. Looks like he's wow. leaving up the Morg, though. All right. Yeah, he's focusing entirely on his own game plan here to the extent where he's just kind of ignoring everything that's happening on the other side of the board, wanting to get the weapon, the poison, and the draw all done on this turn. But here's the downside, exactly what you were just talking about. Second Moog Drain Soul to heal for 12 is going to be exactly the boost, the shot that Tian Ming needed to get him back into this game, start pushing Ooh. that damage. Carry all roam does not work, unfortunately, because that's a zero mana drain soul. Uh, but it could be useful later on, maybe. That is true. I got excited about the Tamsin for the double drain Me souls. Too. But you know what? One drain soul with two morgs is more than enough here. And the armor smith on top of all of that. You know, to be fair to Jake Weiss, he had just seen one drain soul. And in terms of stacking healing with morg, that's really the only card that he needs to be worried about, right? Because um, using morg on touch of the Nathrism still just heals you for four if you kill something. But it's the drain soul that gets more and more value. Uh, but on the flip side of that, this is Handlock we're talking about. They're probably will have the card because they're trying their whole deck. So
so that's a bit of a disaster for Jake Weiss here. Oh man, Tianming, is he actually doing it here? Like he's just going back and forth between armor vendors, shoot it, raise dead, armor vendors, shoot it, raise dead, healing up, gaining armor, drawing his deck. Like the way I see it, he can't be more than absolute maximum three turns away from lethal and very possibly two turns away. Yeah, I think so. Like next turn, he could just get Blightborn Tamsin down, I think, with the unstable yeah. Shadow Blast and a tap. Um, and then after that, he just has Tamsin roam, double hand of Gul'dan and a tour guide. And that tends to end games right on the spot here. So Jake Weiss certainly needs to end the game very soon here. He is also approaching the end of his deck. So the Guild Trader Garot combo is coming together. There's the last deadly poison as well. It's gonna be close, Derek. I think Jake Weiss might just still pull in ahead here. No need to cloak either, I don't think. The minion damage is just not threatening here. He may need to do like the full 30 damage in a turn. Uh, Tianming will not be able to go double touch the Nathrazim again, unfortunately, because of that final proc of the weapon uh, to bring it down to zero. Uh, but he can heal up to 23 at least very easily on this turn. And he might get the second touch to be able to heal up yet further. But he gets the Rust Rot Viper finally coming in to take out the weapon. And with that, I think he very possibly can survive the turn leading into that double Hand of Gul'dan play with the Tamsin. Right, so is there a way to get both Blightborn Tamsin and the Rust Rod Viper down this turn? I'm not sure where the quest counter is at, but as long as Viper comes down, the game plan is still very much alive for Tianming. Okay, so Unstable actually does it, right? Yeah. Just on the tour guide. Yeah, and he gets Tamsin now, but he'll have to go down to 18 in that instance, which is a bit scary. Oh, wait, sorry. How does Unstable work with Moargs again? <laughs> Uh, it doesn't... Oh, it, it doesn't double up. No, 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 it doesn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. He's still just going <laughs> to take five, right, if he played it right yes. now on the tour guide. But that five could still be relevant, being at 18. Again, it's really hard to calculate all the breakpoints. Ooh, what's he doing here? Going Tams in hand now, trying to just set up for playing Tams and getting lethal next turn. As a result, though, he gets himself another touch of the Nathrazim. Two, if he wants them, because of the oh. Tams in draw. This is very clever, I think. Tianming realizes that if he just uses right. Tammy 1 now to copy the Hand of Gul'dan, he can do Blightborn Tamsin and get lethal all in the same turn. And going for Tamsin, smaller Tamsin, that one turn gives him more health leading up into this immediate and last threatening turn from Jake Weiss. So it's just an optimization from Tianming, I think. It's really clever. I love this a lot. Uh, from Tian Ming. Uh, Jake Weiss now has himself how much damage? Guild Trader prep, Wicked Stab, uh, it's 6, 11. It's just not really close, is it? Yeah, I think there's one bleed in the deck, but yeah, not nowhere close enough. Now, is there any world where he can survive? Not at 15, I don't think. <laughs> For Tian Ming, he will see the bottom of his deck just with a tap, and he will be able to get Blightborn Tamsin down just with the Unstable Shadow Blast, right? And that means he will also be able to play Hand of Gul'dan and Blood Mage Thalnos Mortal Coil, which is lots of fatigue coming back Jake Weiss's way. Oh my way. goodness. It has to obviously deal lethal without the minions on board, but it gets, uh, what, one, two, three, four, five it can do compounding, which would be be lethal at that point? Um, hold on. So, first of all, the unstable doesn't get auto tams in here because the minions are a bit too healthy. So I think he has to go uh, tap and what? unstable. And the unstable okay. has to go in a three health minion. That would get tams in on board um, for five mana and zero cards left in the deck. And then Hand of Gul'dan will deal one plus two plus three fatigue. And then the... Thalnos Mortal Coil will deal 4 Fatigue, which is not 15. That's only 11 damage by my count. Well, no, it does 4 plus 5, right? Because Thalnos and the Coil draw a card. Oh, true. Right. Yes, yes, yes. Sorry. So that is the lethal here. So it's literally 15, right? It's exact. 
Yes, I think so. Uh, One, two, two, three, down to nine. Four and five yet to come. He's actually done it. 3-0 oh. sweep against the Weapon Rogue with three decks that by all expectations should be losing to the Weapon Rogue. Tian Ming oh. just playing on an absolute other level here. That was an incredible series of Hearthstone from him and starts to go some of the way of why we are seeing him as one of the top win rate players in Masters Tour history. He's just been doing incredibly well. Only had one top 16 ever in... Uh, uh, what was it? Uh... Dal uh, Orgrimmar, sorry, even earlier than that, Orgrimmar, way back in the year, he was able to get a top eight. And now he's finally coming back in, this time all the way to the top four, beating his previous record and just playing some of the best Hearthstone I've seen in a long while. That's so amazing. Honestly, such a treat to watch him on this specific deck. Obviously, he played amazing in these other games as well, but just the macro understanding of this particular matchup of uh, committing the small Tamsin, not going for Insta Blightborn Tamsin, because on the turn that I was thinking he would play it, he'd go down to 18 health, which very possibly gave Jake Vice um, break points to win from that spot. Instead, he healed up and realized that there is no way for Jake Vice to heal beyond 15, right? So as yeah. long as he could get down the Blightborn Tamsin and get five pro procs of fatigue all in the same turn, then it was always going to be lethal anyway. And that was perfectly calculated, right? With the zero cost hand of Gul'dan. A uh, good spot from you to realize that Thalnos Mortal Coil is two draws there. <laughs> the one through five arithmetic sequence, the perfect 15 damage. So well deserved there. And a heartbreaker for Jake Weiss because that was his GM win and in, is what you were saying? Yeah, I think so. He ends the season now on 11 points, if I'm not mistaken, and 13 is the cutoff uh, for all the uh, players slightly higher up. It's a real heartbreaker and I, you know, my, uh, my heart does go out to him on this one, but I think Jake Weiss still, uh, you know, given that up until now his Masters Tour performances have not been